Um, you know, there, there was a time where we decided, yes, our students are going to need mini lessons. They're going to need a schedule of live sessions that will then prepare them to be successful on their lessons in, in Calvert. So our teachers started getting together. Once they learned the platform, once they made that, those relationships in their rooms, and they had weekly planning sessions. And they took, they would go through the week ahead in Calvert. They would come up with the essential questions. They would come up with, um, with the learning targets for the students and figure out what exactly were they needing to teach in their mini lessons that would then allow the student to go and easily hang up in Google Meet and go to Calvert and be successful on those lessons. So this is just an example of one of those, um, one of the day's plans. You can see they title it with the corresponding day in Calvert. And then they set up what, their, what the kids daily schedule is going to be in terms of live sessions. Here is what you're going to be responsible in your independent practice time. They use cute little engaging slides and um, they'll pull in some additional resources as well because you know our teachers are experts in their content and they may have had a resource that worked really well that could supplement what um, Calvert offered. And so they really, every single grade level, kindergarten through fifth grade, they started preparing these um, slide decks. And you'll see when they get to the end of their instruction, they took screenshots. Okay, this is exactly what you need to do to turn in your assignment. We also found that teachers needed to do a little bit additional prep for the parents and for younger students. You know, how do you make your assignment a PDF on your Chromebook? What is the process of uploading it? Um, because they weren't used to a platform like that, but we reiterate it every single day and give them those basic instructions. So the teachers have done a really good job enhancing and coming up with their lesson plans. Now, in terms of middle and high school, their live sessions throughout the day are more um, focused on like Q&A sessions or office hours, because there are some of our teachers who teach about five preps per block. Um, our math teachers are heavy on their caseload of who they're serving and all of those students. So for them to actually have a live session for many lessons, it may not be feasible based on their schedule and their prep, but they do hold Q&A sessions. They are available for their students throughout the day to answer their questions. Um, and so that's what middle and high school students are doing. So then as teachers got comfortable at that next level, after that was, well, now what do we do with our students who are struggling? We kept assessing them. We kept finding out ways. We took the data that we were getting from Calvert. We still gave map testing um, in the fall and the winter, and we're getting ready to give map testing in the spring. What are we doing with all this data? What are we doing with the students who it's evident they've, they've gone backwards on that COVID, uh, the, um, COVID slide in their in what they know um, and what they're able to do. What do we do with those kids? Well, then we started the small group intervention sessions. So all of this has led into a typical face-to-face -face, um, normal brick and mortar classroom. We have just found ways and slowly, but surely when the teachers were ready, the teachers actually, we knew what the overall goal was, but we couldn't push our teachers to do everything at first. When they got comfortable, they were ready for that next step. They were ready to go forward with interventions. Within the, sec the start of the second semester, we were talking about um, MTSS. What can we do to reach these kids who were in tier one, tier two, maybe tier three? What does that look like? We were able to pull in additional departments from our, our district office and they were able to help us. So again, after all of those conversations, our ultimate then was to make the connections between Calvert and our brick, what was happening in our brick and mortar schools. So we have our district pacing guides, okay? And it breaks up all of our standards, like I'm sure many of you also have your district pacing guides. So I just made a copy of the of our district's pacing guides, but then I had a group, Dr. New and I had a group of teachers go through and they looked at the Calvert pacing as well. 
And so everything is color coded over the district pace. So you'll see anything in yellow, anything in purple, anything in red, and anything in blue. That goes the first nine weeks, second nine weeks, third nine weeks, fourth nine weeks. And our teachers went through and color coded where are we matching up in Calvert with those brick and mortar um, classrooms? Because I don't know about you, but we were having kids going back and forth. Um, our district allowed that door to swing open. We had students who wanted to come into virtual, students who want to go back to face-to-face. -to -face. Oh, change our mind. We don't want to be face-to-face. -face. We want to go back to virtual. So with that, we had to make sure that we were filling in the gaps. And we've communicated this with all of our um, brick and mortar schools. But then we also have found things for our South Carolina standards that may not be covered in Calvert. Well, when are we going to address those? Because we have to teach those standards. Um, but we are just making sure that we have hit every, every detail. We've tried to make sure that um, whatever experience the students are getting as close as possible in the brick and mortar school, we're trying to figure out ways to make it happen in the brick and or in the virtual school as well. So that's kind of how everything has evolved for us this year, how it literally started with a Google form with parents filling out yes or no, we want to be virtual. We picked a program, we got our staff and we just went with it. And that's how it's evolved. And we really have let our teachers lead the way because if they are ready for it, then we know that, that we're not gonna get teacher burnout. We're, you know, we're gonna have some really good conversations with them to make sure that we are serving our students and our community to the best of our ability. So Dr. New, do you have anything you wanna piggyback on? Really quickly, there are a couple of questions that I wanna answer. One was how many students does each teacher typically have in our elementary, we started off with not allowing more than 35 per teacher. And uh, right now, all of my grade levels have at least 30 per teacher. It's, that's K through five, except kindergarten. We're down to about 18. And that's, that's best in kindergarten. We're teaching reading. Melissa might leave y'all with a, a little video about how our kindergartners are learning to read. At the same time, in the middle and high school, some teachers have 170 a day. That's a lot of grading. So we, we put some real, real high expectations on numbers. And so our teachers have stepped up to it. Not easy, but they've done it. I really am impressed with what Melissa said. Three real quick non-negotiables that we've learned. The first one, live sessions really matter. During the day, there has to be some live sessions. Plus, a platform matters. I really would not do this again unless I had both. The two together equal virtual support. Secondly, teachers working at a site has been what I lead to the third non-negotiable, the collaborative planning that is an absolute essential. Um, the planning leads to success for each child in the platform. It has been just an Awesome journey. Thank you, John Robert. Uh, Y'all have been very, very, very good to us. Well, we truly appreciate that. And um, uh, thank you guys for sharing. I know the, there's been some questions coming in. I think you answered that. One question that um, there was asked about, you answered the question about the caseload. There was one more question around how many students were in Anderson 5 virtual. And I know you guys peaked um, at the beginning of this pretty much. And, you know, I can't remember the number, but it was a, a high number of, of your percentage of your students. I mean, virtual. Can we you had, that? We have 13,000 basically students and 4,000 joined virtual in the beginning. In December, students could choose to either come to virtual or return back to face to face. And we had remaining about 2,500 in virtual. So that that's the number right now. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Dr. New. Um, for sharing a little bit about what's going on there in Anderson 5. And I, I know some folks are probably going to be reaching out. If you have questions, feel free to chat those in. Melissa and, and uh, Dr. New, if you can hang around and maybe look at the chat and answer some questions if some folks have um, some questions for you guys, I'd appreciate it. And Jamie, I want to throw it back to you so we can uh, get Vicki queued up here and uh, love to hear from Vicki about what's going on there in Onslow. 
All right, um, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to, without further ado, introduce Miss Vicki Childress. She's uh, basically kind of the, the icon for virtual academies in North Carolina, and she's um, got a great story to tell about the evolution to where she is. Vicki, take it away. Thank you, Jamie. So I am here in Onslow County. We are home to Camp Lejeune, and I noticed in the chat several of you are also military connected communities. So some of these stories are going to resonate with you. It is a unique population that we serve with a unique group of needs. Five years ago, our county realized that we needed to do something with our incoming uh, high school students transferring in from different military installations. We in Onslow are on a four by four schedule and we realized that a lot of our peers throughout the nation are no longer on that schedule. So when students were transferring in, we were losing credits or they were losing credits, leaving us going to them. So we needed to do something to address that. So we reached out to DODEA, which is the Department of Defense, and we received a grant for $1.5 million that allowed us to start a virtual academy to serve our military connected students. Now we do serve civilian as well, but the focus was military connected and military connected students were given preference to the academy. And we like currently what we will do is I have currently five students that are enrolled in Onslow County schools but do not reside in Onslow County anymore. I have one student whose dad was transferred to Mississippi who left us, he's a senior, and wanted to graduate from Southwest High School, which would be his home school here in Onslow County. He is now in Mississippi physically, but is taking classes with us remotely. I have three students that are all siblings their dad was supposed to transfer to Hawaii in the summertime, but COVID pushed those orders and he did not get transferred until October. So I now have three students from Richlands High School sitting in Hawaii and all three of them are enrolled with us and two of them will be graduating in June from Richlands High School. My hope is to travel out to Hawaii. I do have a daughter that lives there. She's married to a Marine and present them with their diplomas from Richlands High School and do a little presentation for them. And I have one senior also from Richlands High School whose same orders, dad's got pulled, got changed. He's now sitting in Japan and she's enrolled with us in Japan, um, in Japan finishing, her, finishing up her coursework in Okinawa. And it was really neat with Ed Options. She was enrolled in several um, uh, AP classes. So we were lucky to keep her because Ed Options had those and we could meet those needs and she didn't miss any of those credits at all. So one thing that's different about us is I'm not a school. I'm a program that serves all eight high schools in our county. And they are they remain in membership at their school. So they're allowed to participate in athletics at their school. And they do everything, prom, pageants, play, musical, band, whatever they wanna do at their school. Most of the kids take us for one or two courses. I do have some that are full time, but the vast majority of us come into us for a course that they would not ordinarily be able to get at their school. Or it's the issue where they like more AP biology and band and they're both offered the same period. So they use us as an option at that point. Um, we have also served some medically fragile kids. I think one of my famous and my most favorite and dear to my heart stories, we had an eighth grader that was on a kidney transplant list. She was in stage four renal failure and she was being serviced at Duke Hospital. And she was having, could not come to school anymore because she was having to get dialysis four times a week and very bright child. We had her for two years and I was talking to her in November, just following up with her cause she's still in the hospital and she was winded and I could just tell things were not doing good. And mama reached out to me and said, we're probably, we're bracing for the worst cause she's not gotten a kidney transplant. We've pretty much been told we're in the short rows. We have weeks to go before we lose her. So we were bracing for a very not good outcome. And right after Christmas, mama called my cell phone number and she was, so, she was crying and I thought it was gonna be bad news but they found a kidney and the child had a tr kidney transplant. She has been with us for two years and we are transitioning her and she is able to step foot back on her home campus of Jacksonville High School and will be back with them in about three weeks doing some face-to-face -face classes for the first time in three years. So programs like this come a long way and do a lot for our kids. I've also become a favorite of our superintendent when we have children that make some not so smart decisions Sometimes you don't need to leave those students in the face-to-face -face environment. 
So they do reach out to me as an alternative for suspension or expulsion. And they have placed some of those students with me, maybe whether it be they made a bomb threat or they've threatened to shoot up the school, even though we know they're probably not going to do those things. But they find their way to me. And we have found that a lot of those kids want to stay with me. They actually don't want to transition back to their campuses. They found a home. They found a place where they're successful for the first time in a while. And they stay with us and everybody's okay with them staying with me. So I have about six or seven of those kids with me right now that do really well. One population, again, I know my, my military installation folks, you see probably like we do, and a lot of people don't struggle with it like we do. We have a lot of young parenting or pregnant teens because they are married to young military men, men that are 18 or 19 and just enlisted, and they have their high school sweetheart with them, and now they're pregnant or have a child, and it's hard for them to go to a face-to-face -face school. So we have enrolled several of those, and for the first couple of years, not gonna lie, we struggled hard with that population with getting them through, but we now have a plan in place that has been successful. We refer to it as the next Netflix program. This generation, if you guys have teenagers, you know what I mean, they will binge watch a series. They want a series of Netflix that has 18 seasons and they'll watch it from one season one to 18 straight through without watching anything else. So why not do that with their courses? So instead of loading four courses in at one time for a kid, we give them one at a time. And when they complete that course, we load the next course in. So we call it binge in a course or Netflix model. It has been beautiful for our at-risk population, for those kids that we would have lost, for those kids that um, would have dropped out or transferred or been a dropout period. One of my favorite ones, I'm going to show you this. This is, yes, my folks down there in South Carolina, I saw a marine installation down there online. This young man drove me crazy. Not going to lie, I spent a lot of time with him. The school would call me and he was not doing what he was supposed to be doing. He was in the library not doing his work and I ended up having to spend a lot of time with him. He graduated, we got him through, and he sent me his boot camp graduation picture. And it sits in my office as a reminder of why we do what we do. So those folks there in South Carolina, kudos to you. You had a little say so and get this young man through too. And now he is a taxpayer and he is working to help pay for my retirement in a few years. So I appreciate that. So another reason, one of the biggest reasons why we did choose ad options and went that route is they, we were one of the first people to join a big group to join on in North Carolina. And when we did, they're like, well, we're gonna need teachers. Can you help us? Oh, I can help you, yes. My background, I've been a middle school and high school assistant principal and principal. So I knew folks throughout the entire district. So when we came online, Ed Options hired several of our teachers. I would interview them. Most of the folks we sent their way, I've either worked for, worked with me, or they had my kids along the way. And they are the rock star, top-notch teachers in this county. Now, I do use Ed Options solely, their teachers, not mine per se, for, for the, um, the foreign language, because they do fantastic. The teachers in this program are phenomenal. I just cannot stress that enough. This morning, my phone, one of them texted me. They're like, hey, I need to call you real quick. I'm like, go ahead and call me. Then you always going into a meeting. And we had a student that is gravely depressed and not doing well at all. And the mother is having issues getting the child into some assistance and cannot get her into therapy and is having tons of issues. So they reached out to me. So I got up with the face-to-face -face school where the kid goes. We've already sent the social work worker out and they've started the paperwork. They come to find out the child doesn't have insurance. And a lot of the places were denying entry for this child who was so severely depressed, but we were able to put resources in place to get this kid up and rolling. And the teacher, a lot of people, that would have been the end of it. She goes, I'm going to call you back on Monday, Miss Childress, and let you know how it goes because I'm going to call her back and check on her over the weekend. That's the quality of teachers you get with that options. So our program, we started out really small. We had 75 kids to begin with because we needed sort of like what Melissa said. I refer to it as we were building the plane as we were flying it and we really were. So we knew we were gonna make some mistakes. We were gonna hit some turbulence and we did and we figured things out. But two things made us change. Our enrollment from 75 to what we're currently sitting at 650. One, we call these kids our flowed kids. Three years ago, Onslow County was impacted drastically, horribly, dramatically by Hurricane Florence. It was a Category 5 hurricane that was stationed off our coast getting ready to make impact and on us. I've lived in coastal North Carolina my entire life, and I can tell you it is the only time I've ever evacuated. And we left. Our school district had over $25 million worth of damage done to the buildings. 
not because of the winds, because she did decrease to a cat one when she came in, but she sat on us for three days and dumped over 35 inches of rain in our area. And our buildings, you know, if you have just one little leak, it gets in the buildings. We had no electricity because the winds are blowing at 85, 90 miles an hour, blew out all of the power lines. Mold grew in our buildings. So we were forced to go remote for a while. My kids did not miss a beat. I gave them about a week off, but then I started hashing them. Okay, let's go. You got a computer? We had two that didn't have a computer. We found a way to get them a computer, no issues. We did not miss a beat. And my kids outperformed the county on those performance tests in January when they came around. So miss no beat, did it well. The second thing that hit us, which has hit everybody in the nation and the world was COVID. Again, we were ready. We have not missed a beat, the teachers or the kids, but it has increased my enrollment. Our district also went to a virtual school model. They had to offer that. Our governor has required a virtual school model be offered for all of our students as well. So they were offered that opportunity. But the high school was struggling with giving them options for electives. They had the typical PE, health, those types of things. So this semester I've taken in about 400 of those kids that typically would not have come my way, but came my way and they're doing great. So, and it's taken a lot of us working together as a partnership. One other thing I think, you know, I like to talk about with our staff here, just how great, again, I'm going back to the teachers because you're only as good as your teachers are in your district and in your organization. We have an overall completion rate of 95 to 98% in online learning, which is almost unheard of. But we hound, we drag, we beg, we cry, we do what we need to do to get those kids across the finish line and in the end we get them across. So that's just a quick little snapshot at Onslow and I didn't check the chat so I don't know if y'all have asked me anything. Hey you got you got several things coming through. I think more people are <laughs> passing accolades for your oh, greatness but thank you. a couple of questions that people sent to me direct what well, you mentioned the ed options um, you, utilizing their teachers can you talk a little bit more about that relationship and how that works for you? Sure. So we will go in and add options when they do the hiring process with us, they're going to give you a teacher that's certified in your state. So North Carolina is a stickler in that. North Carolina has weird, and I'm sure several of you do, you have um, weird certifications that have to happen. So they will go through and they're hire people just for your state. And once you start, they're assigned your students to teachers that are certified. Once you find one or two that you like, you're able to ask for that teacher to stay with your kids because I've done that. I've kept the same foreign language teachers forever because they're just phenomenal. Um, the teachers go through a, a rigorous process with ed options on how to use the material. They go through a great training with them. Um, they have access to the kids and they know, reach out to the schools if there are issues, like I've said. Just great, great, great teachers. The, I, the, I know the one, the one I love, I, my Spanish teacher, she's not mine per se, but she's a Charlotte Met County and she is fabulous. A lot of our teachers are what they consider contract teachers. This is their second job or their side gig, as you will. So they do a lot of this stuff at night, but they do have our um, office hours at night and they do have access to Zoom where they'll pop in and work with the kids and do what they need to do with the kids. They text the kids, they call the kids, because kids aren't gonna answer the phone, let's be honest. Sometimes they won't answer our text. So I always tell them, if you don't answer my text, I'm gonna call you and then you will have to talk to me. So they'll normally respond to my text because I don't even think they know how to answer the phone at that age. So, but the teachers phenomenal that they use and, and they will set you up and take care of that for you. So you don't, I've never had an issue or anything kick back on any HR report about a teacher not being highly qualified or meeting any of the needs for North Carolina. We've never been flagged. Hey, Vicki, this is John Robert over here in South Carolina. I've got Dr. Avery, who's down in uh, Fairfield County, and um, she's asked the question, "What do you? Uh, who do you have on staff to help support your students? Got you. Well, <laughs> it's just me and a part-time guidance counselor, and I've been begging for a full-time guidance counselor for years, and I don't know if I'll ever get that, but we'll see. So it's me doing the, most of the, of the grunt work, as the military would say, and then it is I've got a part-time guidance counselor. And then the teachers, they do do a good job. It helps, that, again, that I know them and a lot of them have worked with me. That's one of the reasons we've been so successful because I can shoot a text out to one of them in like two seconds and they're going to respond back and get it going. Hey, hey so Kristen, Kristen said, do you, do you utilize any teachers in your district to teach with the virtual academy? I think, I think what she may be asking, Vicki, is how the virtual academy, when she mentions ed options, we have a virtual academy through our company. And so what we do, and really it's probably as good a time as any to talk about this. Basically, you're looking at two pretty unique use cases. And John Robert and I were talking yesterday about this 
virtual academy um, implementation model continuum, if you will. Basically, you know, when you look at Melissa and Dr. New's model there, they're utilizing their own teachers. They're basically, um, they're, they're kind of a hybrid utilizing our content, also augmenting that content with their own. But then you move over and you look at Vicki, who Vicki basically has a turnkey virtual academy program that we provide the teachers. Now, mm -hmm. Vicki, you might want to emphasize just a little bit about that. You mentioned about how some of your teachers had started working with us. Can you tell a little bit about that? Yes. Yeah, so and that was one of the biggest selling points for us when we went with Ed Options was we've seen some of the vendors and I was, we were all leery of getting the buy-in from the staff of somebody else teaching our kids and these because I'm not a school, I don't have a school number. So when they take a class that pulls a state exam, that test score is going back on that individual school. So we had to get buy-in from our principals to accept us that we needed some help. And one way to do that was, why can't we use our own teachers maybe? And let's hire some of our folks and let that options pick up our folks. So we went through a screening process. There are about five or six of us that sat together that went through the process. We put the application out. We let them know you're not working for the state of North Carolina. So don't get excited. This is not gonna go into your retirement, all of that stuff It's, it's separate money. And um, we went through an interview process. And one of the things I think that so unique and very telling about the applicants that we used, we used a, I used an email and I sent out six different emails to them with like different scenarios, a mad mama, a good mama, a crazy mama, all of the scenarios that you're going to get. And what I wanted to see was how they were going to respond to those. Because a lot of times, and you know this now, most of you that have dealt with virtual stuff, they don't understand the tone that they sometimes send. And while they may have a great intention on what they're saying, that tone can come across sometimes as being snide or rude or condescending, and we didn't want that. So that was really our biggest catalyst that we use when we're testing those folks. And when they made it through that process, I sent a list of maybe 20 or 30 up to Ed Ops, as I said, these are the folks that are cleared that we're good to go and we're happy to work with. We sent them to them and they made the, fire, the final decision. And it's not just us that use those teachers. I know Durham, I know you have some of our teachers. Pender County uses a lot of the same teachers when I refer to them as mine. They're the ones we sit the Ed Options way. Um, I know Rocky Mountain Nash uses them. So they're out and about and they teach several other folks throughout the state of North Carolina. And they, they actually like it because it's the second, like I said, it's their side gig. And a lot of them are, have college students like I do. I've got a, a kid in college. So um, they were happy to get a little bit of extra revenue coming in to pay for those wonderful tuition bills. But it's, it's just been a great relationship with them. And I've not had a turnover. I can tell you in the five years I've done this, if I've ever had to hire a new person or send a new person for them to hire for me, it's because the numbers were going to increase and I needed that additional person. We've not lost anybody. And I had people banging and knocking at my door wanting to come in and work with Ed Options with us on the side because and I'm like, I, I don't not gonna have anything that I can see, but I appreciate you asking. So it's been a, it's, I have the opposite problem of what most school systems have is I have probably a teacher surplus more so than a teacher shortage. So that's a good problem to have. It is. It's a very different <laughs> problem than what most people were saying this time last year. I yes, think. yes. So uh, I see another question here from Christian. Um, does your district offer a virtual option for grades K through eight? Do you do it's the a, younger kids as well, Vicki? It's a good question. We've dabbled some in middle school. Our middle school has been um, whenever we have homeschool kids coming in. That's also a big issue in our military towns is a lot of our students do stay homeschooled, especially K through eight. They normally find their way to a high school. Well, uh, we do have a, a high school on base here, but most of them still find their way to us their high school years so they can participate in those extracurriculars, athletics and band and those types of things. So most of the element, I didn't, I've not done any elementary, but all of the middle that I have dealt with have been homeschool situations where we were getting the kid in. They'd start maybe their sixth grade year with me full time. And then by seventh grade year, they do half a day at the school and a half a day with me and just transition. It was a nice transition for the mamas and the dads and the kids not to go straight shock from being homeschooled to all of a sudden being thrown into a regular school setting. It's been a nice bridge. We've had maybe about 15 or 20 of those kids that have come across. And then we've had the kids that are just AIG accelerated, really bright and are sitting in seventh grade and already in algebra two. Well, none of our middle schools have algebra two or math two. So they've had to come through me for those as well. So we've dabbled in that a little bit as well. Melissa, Melissa, you, you on the other hand though, you guys have dealt with several elementary students, correct? Yes, we have. 
Mm -hmm. We have um, a really good, strong group now after the transition um, in after the end of semester one, um, we still have a very strong group of elementary teachers and uh, families who have stuck with us. And uh, just like Vicki, you know, we actually have teachers knocking down the doors wanting mm -hmm. to stay or wanting to um, some had to go back face to face just because the numbers and then the resources that were um, that were needed back in the brick and mortar. And it was a hard, hard day when they had to take their office and go back to their classroom. There were a lot of tears, um, a lot of sadness, but, you know, it just has been it's been great. But we do serve kindergarten through 12th grade in our virtual academy. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Hey, John Robert, have you picked up on any questions? We're at the 45 minute mark. I, I don't know how far you want to go. I mean, I'd love to. I could, I'm like Dr. New, I could sit and listen to Melissa and Vicki talk about this all day, but I want to be respectful of everybody's time. Oh, you're muted. I'm there muted. Sorry. Um, no, I don't have any, I don't see any other questions in the chat at the moment, but if there's others that, um, that you would like to chat in while we have Melissa and Dr. New and Vicki, would love to get your questions answered. I know some of you are kind of in the throes right now of planning and designing and, and and discussing processes and procedures with your teams. And, you know, if there's any things that you would like to, um, you know, if you have certain questions, feel free to throw those in the chat or reach out to us directly and we'll, we'll, um, we'll, we'll do that as well. So, um, or we'll get those questions answered. Uh, we're at time. It is 45 minutes. We try to keep these uh, meetings within 45 minutes. We're going to hold one more session this month. Actually, it's going to be next Friday um, on mitigating gaps because I know that's another uh, piece that, that is really striking a nerve with folks right now is around is, you know, how do we uh, address the learning loss associated with COVID-19? And so uh, joining us, you'll see a follow-up email from us with a survey attached. Um, we want your feedback. What can we do better? How can we make these things more uh, appealing to you? What topics would you like to see? Would you like to present? Is there something that, that you've done really well that we can showcase uh, for other districts and learn from you? So uh, feel free to please respond to those, those surveys because we do take those seriously and we do look at those uh, as soon as we get those out. So you'll probably get an email from us on Monday. Um, and then in that email, you'll see a, a link to register for our session on Friday, next Friday. We're gonna have some folks sharing about how, what they're doing already to help mitigate those gaps. Um, in their district and the schools. So yeah. uh, thank you guys so much. Uh, Melissa, Vicki, if you can hang around in case somebody else has some questions. But other than that, uh, we'll, we'll sign off. And thank you guys, have a great day. Have a good weekend. Hey, thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Hey, Melissa, this is Angela Hinton in Spartanburg, too. I had to get up and run out of the room for just a couple minutes, but I was going to ask you about how many students do each of your teachers teach? Sure. Hi, how are you? Good. How You're are not you? far. <laughs> not at all. Um, well, at what level? Because um, our elementary teachers, um, they have a much smaller caseload than our middle and high school teachers. Yes. Let's start with elementary. Sure. So right now, um, after the shift and what teachers are left, pretty much uh, second through or maybe first through fifth grade have about a 30 student caseload, a little bit okay. less, a little bit more um, for those. And then I believe Dr. New mentioned that um, in kindergarten, they're in the teens. Okay. But then you have middle and high school and they could be potentially serving anywhere from 75 to almost 200. It just depends on what the teacher is certified to teach, what courses are, um, you know, what courses need to be offered. And you, you just know how scheduling goes with middle and high school. Absolutely. Well, I was talking with my superintendent and he was talking about the superintendent's meeting yesterday. They were talking about for next year and that some folks were saying, you know, they really did not want to even offer virtual for K through two. 
you know, if possible. But I know that as we are planning, we need to run, you know, our plans by Bradley Mitchell and take a look at, you know, the legislation for seat time and all those different requirements, um, you know. So are you guys still thinking about K through two for next year or what are y'all thinking? So it is up. You are absolutely correct. Correct. I know everybody met and the conversations just keep going round and round. We know that the K to two, those kiddos really need to be in a face to face setting, um, especially for those families who don't have the resources at home or the parents who can't give the attention to the children to be that partner, have that partnership with what the district has to offer, the teachers teaching, what the child needs, but you are that parent. You are the face-to-face -face with those with those babies. Um, now, I will say that we, our, our K-2 to teachers have worked really, really hard on making sure they're constantly assessing. Um, our, those, those teachers actually have had multiple opportunities of going back to their home schools and assessing those kids face-to-face. We've really tried to give multiple opportunities for kindergarten through second graders to be with a teacher right there for DRA testing, for ISTEEP, for COGAT. Well, one of them was, I think, second and third. But anyway, we have tried to create as many of those um, opportunities for teachers to get right in front of the students and assess what they need. And then we are offering these intervention sessions right? Um, but getting those students engaged enough to do their required live sessions and then come for additional small group sessions has been a struggle. Um, so I know that the ultimate goal is to get all of those kids back face to face. They need to be. We need to see them writing. You know, we, we can't see them writing in their small sessions. They hold up their paper of what the end result is, but what's the process? How are they getting there? And Dr. New and I talked about a solution for that, that we can turn their Chromebooks. There's a little attachment for their webcam that turns their Chromebooks into a document camera. So as the teacher's writing in the small group, she's also seeing them actually write. So, but as far as a final decision, it goes back and forth. <laughs> I know. We're just kind of trying to prepare different scenarios and, you know, run them by Bradley and get some input. And, uh, but we loved what you guys are doing. It sounds like we're doing some similar things, but uh, we did not have near the number interested. We had about 14% of our district go virtual in the beginning, and now we're at just 8%. So we're extremely low. And, um, but, you know, we supplemented the Calvert lessons and did all of those things as well. So if we go this direction next year, it will be great to reach out and partner some. Absolutely. Yes, work smarter, not harder. Yes. <laughs> All right. Hey, thank you so much, Melissa, for taking the time to answer uh, Dr. Hinton's question there. And um, Vicki, there was a question in the here. Um, can you tell us how this differs from utilizing uh, NCVPS as well? Absolutely. Yes. So in North Carolina, we do have a virtual public school that all of the public schools are allowed to enroll students in. And sometimes what people do not realize is how that school is funded. You're actually going to be deducted ADM positions from your teaching rosters whenever you use NCVPS. So if you put like 30 students in a psychology class in about two years, that's going to cost you a teaching position somewhere in your county. That's how the state pays for it. Um, so that's one of the biggest difference between us. Our district would much rather come on up out of pocket for it. And we're cheaper. NCVPS runs roughly about, I'm, I'm going to ballpark it, $375, $400 for a semester class and about $800 to $1,000 for a year-long AP class. So um, Ed Options is coming in grandly for us under that, that figure at all. So that's one of the biggest differences. To us, the other difference was, and um, NCVPS is not as flexible as we are able to be. They have two main calendars. There's an early start. So like for kids that are like at the early college or schools that start before Labor Day, they have a calendar and then you have the regular start. Outside of that, you can't pull kids in and out like I can. So they like I've had three schools call me today, want me to enroll kids that I put in today. You can't do that with NCBPS. I mean, I guess you can, but the kids could be eight modules behind. 
they are not going to let them, the teachers, one of the NCVPS, and I, I can speak on this because I've worked some in the past for NCVPS, the teachers do not have some of the flexibility to modify and get kids across the finish line like what Ed Options gives us. So for example, if I had a student that I knew was struggling and I felt that I needed to go in and take away an assignment or two out of a module to get them ahead, that maybe it was a repetitive activity, the teachers in NCVPS are not allowed to do that unless they go up the chain of command almost to like the principal per se and say, I need to do this. So the teachers don't have the autonomy to make those decisions that a teacher in Ed Options has, whereas Ed Options is like, okay, I'm gonna take this assignment away, let's get you back on pace. And the turnaround time for talking to someone, actually getting someone physically to call you back is much faster with that options than it is with NCVPS. And we've used NCVPS, our district sure does, don't get me wrong, I'm not talking bad about them at all either. But we're a totally different model in that we're flexible and we have we're cost less and we have a lot more local control than what we do if we're through NCVPS. Awesome, thank you, Vicki. All right. Thank you. I know I had a lot of questions today, um, but we uh, we kind of do a, a blend of what both Melissa and Vicki are doing. And so we're exploring our options on where we want to go, if we want to use the same vendor that we use this year and what's going to be best for students, but also financially responsible. Yep. Yep. Uh, Kristen, you're, you're not alone having that conversation. And um, not only would Vicki and Melissa be willing, I would think, to speak to you about it, we would be happy to sit down with you and discuss it with you as well. Thank you so much. We appreciate that. Yes, ma'am. All right, we're sliding up close to the to the top of the hour, man. Uh, yep. John Robert, you want to you want to yep. tie a bow on this thing? Yes, sir. Let's get out of here. Thank you guys so much. Y'all have a great weekend. I, th I think that's been all of our questions in the chat. Again, uh, Melissa, Dr. New, Vicky, we can't thank you enough for your partnership. Thank you for sharing your stories with us and how you guys have created this. It's unbelievable uh, what you guys have done. So. Uh, thank you for being a resource for all our folks here today. Uh, yeah. Guys, take care, and I'm going to sign us off. Bye-bye. Later, everybody. Have a great Bye, weekend. Bye, y'all. Have a great weekend.